Well, good evening to you all. I'm very happy to be in Asheville. It has become like a, a yearly tradition now that we do. Uh, we meet every uh, year here in Asheville, and I see the whole Bajomtri family from all around the world. So it's really a pleasure coming here. And uh, thank you, Robert, for the introduction we did, you know. He did a very good introduction. Now there's nothing left. I don't know what I'll do up here. <laughs> yes. And I told him I'd pay him a dollar for every time he says my name. Now I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> Completely broke now. <laughs> okay, what I'll do now, we, we'll go a bit uh, on, on a lighter side and go more into uh, spiritual aspects without uh, going too much into details of the material, but show uh, a bit of uh, the spirituality behind by geometry. So, first of all, I'll just the first few slides here, we don't need them because uh, Robert uh, did the introduction. Now I know something about myself. I mean, he really did it well. <laughs> and uh, these are the, some of the projects, you know, I started my life as an architect building uh, hospitals. So uh, I built about 60 of those clinics and uh, about half a dozen of those uh, huge hospitals there. And then later on, I'm a tourist planner basically. So I did the tourist planning for the Red Sea to bring in uh, beach tourism to Egypt and all that. So we did that in the 80s. So basically, and we planned so, so many tourist areas, tourist projects. That's me in my office, <laughs> yeah. If you want to come and see me in Cairo, just come to my office. The chair is there, see, you can come and sit there. That's one of my projects there, so. Okay, and that's my book, so. Now, let's go into, well, it, the, the title doesn't look very spiritual to me. But, but, but let's see how it develops, you know. I'll show you some very nice pictures about the Earth, showing uh, all those energy lines, you know, heat energy lines over the Earth. They look very nice pictures now. Th these are from a very uh, nice site called Globia. They have very nice pictures showing that. But the thing is here that until now, until our era now, uh, life on Earth was somehow uh, governed by nature. It was nature who dictated a bit with the development of every living creature on Earth. And uh, until now, this was the case. And then when you look at this, we enter into a new age. It's called the Anthropocene. Anthropocene means, Anthropos means the human age. So now, the human being has replaced nature in dictating the future of living uh, species on Earth. And these slides show why. Because now the human being has come and has coated nature with a new man-made sort of coat in the atmosphere. And this coat is actually the new uh, major factor affecting life on Earth. So man now has taken over. That's how it looks, you know, how our atmosphere looks. It's completely covered by man-made energies. Look at this one. So what will happen here if the Earth looks like that now? See, you might like the pictures, but uh, you might not like the results. Okay, so now all, you've seen all those moving lines there. Now, we are in an age that uh, is mainly governed by information. So we're in the information age. The information age depends on uh, electromagnetic radiation. And we are always thinking about the effects of electromagnetic radiation on life. We think human being is affecting life negatively just because of electromagnetic radiation. And so we think that uh, if I'm far enough uh, from a, a cable and uh, I'll be safe, or if I can measure the electricity about a certain level, I'm safe. We're thinking 
of this age only from the side of electromagnetic levels I can measure with my devices. Now, this is not exactly the case. This is only a very small part of the problem. If we don't know the real problem, then we'll never be able to solve it. Uh, today, we take the word for electrosmog and electromagnetic radiation or stress, electromagnetic stress, as one and the same. People think, okay, this is a slang word, electrosmog is a slang word for electromagnetic stress. But in reality, it's not like that because it's like the difference between fog and rain. You know, electromagnetic radiation, something like, it's like rain. And then fog is not rain. Fog is a standing state, you see. Now, in London, when there was a lot of gases from cars and traffics and all that that came into this continuous fog that they have over there, they, they named it smog. See, so smog again is a standing state. It's, it's another phase of fog. It's, let's say, dirty fog. When you put a lot of dirt in there, you get smog. Okay, electrosmog is, is when you come on all that and you put some electrical, uh, let's say, stress in there. Well, how should we understand it? You, you, you could say, I don't measure it. I can go in the fog, I can go in the smog, I measure. Where is, is it? Well, let's see the nature. What is electrosmog to begin with? If we want to do something about it, we'd better uh, understand a bit how, what it is. Now, it is very simple. It's so simple that modern science has just missed it. Now, if a boat moves like that, you get the direct effect of the boat. If, you, if you're here, it will hit you. If, yeah, that's the first direct effect. <laughs> the second effect, okay, if you go away from the boat like that, you have those waves here. But if you go far enough here, you think you're safe. And that's how we look at the problem. But in reality, what happens is if you go even one mile away and you have an object in the water, you'll find that you have those slight waves coming and the object moving like this, you see. So sometimes for long distances. So there is a secondary effect from any motion that is like what we call compression waves. Compression waves are very simple, are those waves that come from any motion in any medium. For example, uh, sound is a compression wave. Uh, wh when I walk like this, I just walk, okay, I create compression waves. Imagine that you're like a fish in the water. Imagine what around us is, is a medium, the air is a medium, so you can easily think if we were inside the water and I'd do this, you see, you'd see waves. So these are compression waves. They're like, compression waves are very similar to sound waves. So as everything is moving in the universe, that means everything is creating compression waves around it. Now, something like the sun, the rays of the sun, we always think electromagnetic radiation. But if a ray is moving, any ray of light, it will produce around it this compression waves. So there are more sound waves or inaudible sound waves, let's call them, coming from the sun than actual light. So if instead of the boat, I take the example of the sun and I put an electromagnetic sort here, an electromagnetic wave. I have the field around it, so that's the first effect. If I have an object here in the field, I get the first effect, and that is being in the electromagnetic field. If I go out here, supposed to be safe, but this area is the area of those inaudible sound waves, and this is the area of electrosmog. Several researchers today define electrosmog 
as a compression wave phenomena. Like in the background, you have the whole universe has a background carpet weave of sound waves. And that's the background carpet weave. And what electrosmog is like a background echo that's there all over the universe. This background echo, depending on the motion that created it, will have qualities from that motion through resonance come into it and it will propagate it. Now, this is the totality of, of what happens with electricity. So if our civilization is only worried about what happens here and misses that, by the time they discover that, we'll be long gone. So, yes, so now this is, this domain of compression wave the, the, can be on several levels of vibration. Uh, for example, uh, the people uh, in Germany, like Dr. Constantine Mail, who is the main authority uh, on scalar waves, uh, speaks on the scalar wave effect. If you have this uh, electromagnetic radiation, it creates those compression waves here that carry the qualities from it, and they are called scalar waves. So you could say electrosmog is a scalar wave phenomena. But on another level, uh, torsion waves create it. So electrosmog can also be a, a sort of a torsion wave phenomena. It could be any one of those levels. Uh, it could be also electrosmog is a hypersound pheno phenomena. Hyper or hyposound. This is saying again inaudible sound waves. So if I go here on the hypersound level, you see, you, you, you get it's like objects, any objects in it, when everything is moving, radiate around them this hypersound. And now the body has hypersound sensors in the bones. So this electrosmog, it's really eating you from inside, you know? <laughs> yeah, because you're full of sensors everywhere to this inaudible sound. So unless we treat sound or inaudible sound seriously and not just music that we enjoy and, and thank you for, for and applaud and everything like that, if we treat sound as the background carpet weave of the universe, then we can do something about it. And that, when we speak about uh, sound, let's look at how we deal with sound in some of the disciplines we know. For example, in acoustics. I know as an architect, for example, when I build a theater, I can affect compression waves through the shaping, sh shapes. Shapes are a way of dealing with uh, sound. Uh, you, you, for example, in aerodynamics, it's also compression waves like that. You, ha you shape the car. You see in the racing car, you have those wings on them and all those things. So you use shapes again to deal with it. So the way of interacting with compression waves in the compression world, you interact through shapes. And this is where the energy of shapes, since everything is moving, that means all shapes interact with the energy quality of the background and produce this phenomena that we call energy of shape. Because many people don't believe that there is something called energy of shape. Shapes do not produce energy. How can this table produce energy? But if this table were in a current of water, here, under it, you'd see turbulences that do certain effects. So then you would say, oh yes, it's producing energy because it's in water, yeah, but everything is moving. So shapes produce energy. But now, we are not concerned about quantitative aspects of energy, because our bodies are not interested on this one, unless it's really overwhelming. We are concerned about the minute levels that carry certain qualities that my body senses and that affect me. So shapes, let us take an example. You all know that when you have a, a prism, a crystal prism like that and uh, light goes through it, on the other side you get 
colors. I don't have to, to put a slide for that, and we all know that. So, on one side, you have quantitative, you, you know, the frequency of light. But on the other side, you see colors. Colors are not out there. They don't exist out there. It's the effect of this radiation levels, or, or let's say, uh, wavelengths or frequencies on our brains, and we produce the color. So color is a quality. The word quality means interaction. Quality means it's something has to interact with something. It's the quality of an effect. Effect produces quality. Anyhow, the main, uh, let's say, the main definition of energy is the ability to produce an effect. So anyhow, energy is defined through its qualities, through its effects, through its effect on other things. It's not defined. In itself, until now, we don't know what energy is. Uh, Richard Feynman, our famous physicist, says we use energy in everything in life and uh, we still don't know what it really is. So, now, if color is quality, every color through the, the different angle gives a different color. So you can say that angles correspond to the colors, so we can say that angles are qualities. Okay? Now, if angles are qualities, Angles are the components of form. Angles are components of any shape. Well, okay, then it means shapes are qualities. So shapes are frozen qualities out there. So every shape there, by its proportion, by all that, is a frozen quality that affects the environment. Now, if we have a science of quality, with which to design the, the shape and bring harmony into environment, problem solved. See? So it's very easy to shift and see every shape as a quality emanating in the environment. And that, that is by geometry. But by geometry goes a step further. We don't want any quality. We want a harmonizing quality. So by geometry should reproduce the harmonizing quality that Robert introduced, which is the harmonizing quality found in sacred power spots that can actually, where sick animals go and get healed, where some animals, when they feel they, they're dying, they go in such power spots because they know this is their doorway to, to the other side. They, they, they don't want to go through uh, bad energy and uh, end up in a bad place. The, the, even animals, they, they know better than we. I mean, they go there and find the right doorway. So, if we take that energy quality, this balancing energy quality, and put it in all the design of our shapes, then all our shapes become quality emitters, and then everything becomes a sacred power spot. So then, the act of designing a shape or building a building or doing something becomes a sacred ritual. And that's how it was in ancient times. You, you couldn't design. An architect couldn't just start on a project. He had any sacred ritual means you have to do prayers, you have to fast for so many days, sometimes it was 28 days for fasting, and then when you were ready, you could start the design. Well, I mean, we've forgotten that today, you know. <laughs> yeah, the client can't wait 28 days for you, you know, till you prepare yourself. <laughs> so, this is, uh, I just went a bit to explain now, very important, how any shape could actually be uh, called sacred, be called spiritual. Now, this design principle exists already. It exists in all natural shape. Nature designs that way. Now, if I was here with you and uh, I wanted to speak to you about biogeometry or, or any other subject, and I didn't speak any language that you spoke, I wouldn't be of much use, you know. I could as well just dance for you or do something, but 
<laughs> yeah, but that wouldn't be of much use. Okay, now imagine that we are born and live all our life and there's a divine hand writing and designing all the shapes of nature in front of us and nobody reads. We don't read. So what are we doing here? Yeah, what are we doing here? We're actually, you say, no, I read and write. Okay, it's like you're standing in the mirror speaking to yourself. It's humanity speaking to itself and forgetting about nature. But the divine pen that writes, nobody reads. So how can you live in harmony with nature if you don't read this language? So we have to start understanding, reading the language of shape and learning the forming process of nature. Otherwise, there's no going forward. So look at nature, when nature designs. You see, all when nature is dictating life on Earth, the bird doesn't have the free will I have. But it's a better architect. It's by far a better architect. Imagine now, the bird is building a nest out of very, very fine things like strings like that uh, that have no, uh, actually, uh, power to build something, I mean, very fine, but they're put together, threaded together in such a way that they build the nest. Okay, this is a structural, uh, uh, it's a very advanced structural way of doing something, but that's not, that's our way of, uh, l let's say, thinking technologically. It's not about that. It is about how the nest is designed in a way to amplify and protect the energy of the bird and the eggs. So it's like a second home, because nature, on every level, it, it does this design. When nature designed humanity, the same thing that happened here, it's in the design of a woman. Why do we look at women as sacred? All the women now are now smiling. Women are sacred, huh? Don't believe all what I say. I mean, this is just for the lecture. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Because <laughs> it sounds good in the lecture. So, but if a woman carries a, a sacred cave inside. The womb with sacred water inside the tomb. Medicine is slowly discovering what it can do from that water to cure things. But imagine a sacred cave with sacred water that has healing properties. That means the uh, fetus in there is protected in the hands of the universe, in the hands of divinity, even protected from the mother herself. But the mother herself is the carrier of a cave. So this is the house. A house is something that is in the hands of divinity, something that protects you. So here we have the house and then the shape of the egg. Of course, when nature creates the egg, it's, if you make the egg just a circle, it would be in perfect balance, but it would be the energy in it would be too static. Then you take two centers and you have an ellipse. Already you have a duality in there working, but it's still static duality a bit. But make one smaller than the other, and then you have a dynamic stability where life can grow. You have the stability, but growth, the power of growth. So. The, this is the house for this. The egg is the house for what's inside it. See how nature goes about developing things. And then if we look at this, at the structure of a nest, it's very solid. You, you can, this is wire mesh, you can stand on it. You know, it's so solid. And here is the next step, is the Beijing uh, thing, you see. It's based on the bird nest. So, 
did we learn a lesson from the bird nest here? Who thinks we did? Actually, we didn't. We learned a lesson on one level, on the technological level, we learned the lesson, but this steel mesh here and all that actually uh, kills your energy of vitality. It's not made to, to do something, the qualitative aspect on the life force of, of the human is not there. It's not like the bird's nest. The bird's nest is not just a physical achievement. The bird's nest is a much, much, uh, when you look at it, it works on so many levels, you know. So look at the bees when they build their homes. The, the healing aspects that come out of it. Healing aspects that come out of honey. So now, let us look at our home. <laughs> or, yeah, we build our beehive <laughs> to live in it. Everybody does his little activity in there, in, in these cramped spaces. And that is our, our beehive compared, the wisdom of the human compared to the wisdom of nature. So look at, for example, very nice inside our beehive. We go in, we have a home. Oh, this is much nicer than living in a beehive. But you know what? You're sleeping on the bed here, and there's a cable, electrical cable in the wall right behind you here. And you have your pineal gland and your pituitary gland directly into the electromagnetic field of that cable. So the pineal gland, that means no melatonin. That means you don't sleep well. And uh, the pineal gland is also a tumor suppressor. So there's no <laughs> tumor suppression. And the pituitary gland, the other one here, is the gland that governs all the other glands in the body. So this is the master, the, the director up there. And if the director is drunk or, or something, guess what happens? People today get, for example, when this is disturbed, you get thyroid problems, you get uh, diabetes, you, you get liver problems, you get uh, prostate problems, you get whatever, or you get uh, kidney uh, problems because the master gland is not working properly. So imagine this master gland that controls all the glands. You go every night and you plug your phone to be charged in the wall and plug your head to be charged in the bed. <laughs> and then you complain about all the health problems you have. 